Hi everyone, um, today I'm going to talk about the referenced photograph and ask you really what does a photographer know anyway? Um, this is part of the series in which we're looking at how um, photographers who maybe don't have yet a global audience are reaching their audiences and also how significant they are in terms of the artwork they actually create. Because regardless of whether you have already found fame as a visual artist or whether you're still waiting in those wings, whether you don't seek fame at all, the fact is that the photographs put out on any visual platform, if they reach the hearts and minds of the viewer, are making an impact that is as important in its power as anything we might ever find in a gallery. Um, so the photographer that I've selected for this today is Dan Pratt. Um, he's an American, um, mainly putting his work on Instagram. Uh, and personally, I've followed his work for quite a long time. The thing that made me uh, really pause when I first saw his photographs is their really beautiful luminosity. The quality of light in the work he shows us is really unlike any other photographer um, I, I know working today. That doesn't of course mean that there's not other photographers somewhere uh, working in this style. But there's just some particular sense of balance between colour, form, and as I said already, this quality of light. Um, he lives in New York. He photographs in and around New York, uh, Brooklyn. And his work is very uh, poetic, I think. So you've got an image on the screen just now. It's called The Fruit Streets. It's in Brooklyn Heights. I really want us to think, you know, part of this series has been looking at Ben Ashley's work. Um, and thinking about going places with a photographer. Um, as much as Dan Pratt's not really taking us to particularly far-flung places, nonetheless he is transporting us to the place with him. And I want us to think about that. Do we get a sense of place from the work we're seeing here? Do we feel transported? Um, very clever um, in the way that, especially in a city environment, a photographer might close down their frame so that we see uh, snippets, um, almost like teasers, of what the wider city might be like. So I'm not seeing a huge city skyline in any of Dan Pratt's photographs really, but what I am seeing are these beautiful um, architectural details. I'm noticing that he's noticing things about shadows, for example. Um, and it's very evocative. I mean, I, I grew up in Scotland, but I grew up in the city mainly uh, with a lot of emphasis on older architecture in the very old city um, of Glasgow. And when I see images such as the one that's on the screen just now, I am not just with Dan Pratt in Brooklyn Heights, but I'm also with Sandy Robertson, aged 12, on Bath Street in Glasgow. And it takes me right back to a point of reference that I understand. I think particularly in this image, the, the quality of the shadow is again kind of like a teaser. It's leading us into an understanding of what's going on in the photograph. And although nothing is actually going on in the photograph, there are no people to divert us or to, to give us that kind of narrative quality that we might find in another style of photography. Nonetheless, there is still a feeling that something is happening. And I think windows, to mention windows as a thing, are very um, significant uh, symbols in any visual art. You know, we're looking into the window of the art itself and then through it, another window again. Um, and perhaps that is about humans seeking the stories of other humans all the time and um, wanting to know about life and life not just here and now, but life there and then, too. What strikes me is that uh, where we have a very muted colour palette in this photograph, it allows us really to linger with the light. We've got the reflected lights on the window panes, we've got the shadows cast by the, the fire escapes and the wrought iron of the balconies. And it really, really reminded me of the work of uh, Walker Evans, who was trekking along these streets um, 
almost 100 years ago making photographs. And so Walker Evans is a very famous American photographer. You can see the dates there, his lifespan. Um, he had a fascination with Brooklyn Bridge. He photographed widely around the States. Um, but New York held a kind of special magic for him. He's not alone, nor is Dan Pratt. I mean, New York is um, the city that never sleeps. It's been immortalized in um, mainstream notions of kind of success and the Big Apple and our kind of mythology that we've built up culturally around an American dream. Uh, and especially movies, I think, have really given us a strong sense of what it might be like to, to live in New York, to love in New York, um, there are lots of romantic notions about the city, uh, but anyway, Walker Evans photographing 100 years ago, 80 years ago, walking around and looking at very similar things to the things that Dan Pratt is actually looking at now. The, the, the mode of his delivery is slightly different, he's shooting in black and white and he was printing uh, on paper and using film camera, whereas Dan Pratt is obviously putting his work on Instagram, it's a digital platform, he's shooting in colour. But there are qualities that are the same, not just because both photographers are looking at New York urban um, settings. It's uh, again about this quality of light. It's again about um, a formalism in the, the shapes and rhythms that we might find in the urban setting. Um, if you look, for example, the very humble photograph is actually the largest photograph on the screen just now. The banister with the cast light in the shadow. That to me is a very quiet photograph of a very noisy place um, and again this sense that rather than looking at huge city skylines, wide vistas, we're being brought right into a really quite an intimate and almost banal seeming point of the city. But that has its own quality of meaning. It also has um, Again, this sort of evocative sense, you know, have we ever sat on a stoop like that? Have we ever been children playing, skipping up and down those steps? Um, certainly for me, it does remind me of that kind of city, city life as a child. Um, anyway, as I said, Dan Pratt shooting in colour very skilled at taking us to a place and sometimes unlike his um, external architectural photographs he's taking us into these very quiet very beautiful very elegant interiors um, and and I'd like us to think about what space we're actually entering here um, you know does it matter where we are at all um, does it matter that we don't recognise something external, we don't see a building's facade in these? But there is still this same sense, I think, across all of his work that is highly considered, very formal and quite quiet. Again, we've got this beautiful interplay between light and shadow. Um, and actually, in all of the images that Pratt shoots, I really do get the sense that I would like to be there now as much as, as I said, I make a, a connection with what I was like in the past or places I have been or experienced in the past. And when we're thinking about these kinds of things, I guess we're kind of questioning what we can sense that's beyond the visual. So our sense as photographers is guided by what we see, but really there are other senses at play you know, our sense of sound, what we're hearing when we're in these places or spaces, the temperature, um, you know, a really good exercise sometimes if you're ever stuck analysing a photograph is to chuck random things at it, like is it hot or cold? Is it noisy or loud? To really think about these sensory impressions. Um, and I think Dan Pratt is highly skilled, in fact exceptional, at giving me sense of a place. Um, I've mentioned already Walker Evans and to me that's an inevitable link between somebody who photographs a city like New York 
then and somebody who photographs a city like New, like New York now. And obviously there are similarities uh, or correlations between um, photographing the architecture of a place then as well as now. But something that really struck me when I first saw Dan Pratt's photographs is quite how Hopper-like they are. Edward Hopper, the kind of celebrated uh, American painter, uh, is another person who's concerned himself with um, windows, um, with this quiet nature of a city that is known to be busy all the time, the city that never sleeps, mm, a thoughtfulness, a thoughtfulness about the city. We perhaps overlook that in our ideas about what a city is, especially a city like New York. Um, but in Hopper's paintings, I've always been able to access a sense of quiet, um, not a sense of mystery really, but again this thoughtful illumination, um, often of uh, single figures in the frame. I mean, his most famous Nighthawks painting has got lots of different characters, but still there's a kind of emptiness, a loneliness to them. And that actually makes these pieces all the more beautiful to me. Now, I'm sure when we look at Pratt's work again, we can immediately see a lightness. In fact, I thought it was really uh, funny uh, that in one of his photographs, actually the one you can see above me now, uh, he has actually shot somebody in a gallery looking at Hopper's, Edward Hopper's self-portrait. And, and the caption is something like um, inspiration or something like that or muse or, or something. So it was obvious to me even then, having never met Dan Pratt, not being able to find any other information about him other than his Instagram account as him as a photographer, was that here I was thinking about Hopper the whole time and then I discovered this. And I realized that of course he knew who Hopper was. Of course he understood the reference in his own work. And then when you look at the other photographs here on the screen just now, we've got this beautiful painterly quality in the, in the use of light, that shadow, the contrast between the light and the dark, it's very, very Hopper-esque in its execution. And, and though Hopper obviously came first, he was working throughout um, the, the middle of the, the 20th century, a little bit before, um, and obviously now I know that Dan Pratt is aware of Hopper as an artist and in actual fact loves Hopper as a painter, um, I wonder if at the moment of making the photographs, Dan Pratt's actually aware of the reference. That's a fascinating thing uh, and something I want us to think about in our work is I can tell you, let's go look at this photographer this week and then let, let's make our photographs in that style. And we're using that as a, as a way to learn. But really at that kind of moment of pushing the button on the camera. Are we still in the in the mind of somebody making a reference or have we gone beyond that altogether? So Pratt has been influenced by Hopper. He's also out with his camera and maybe, maybe um, it would be interesting to know if he photographed this way before he made the relationship in his mind with what Hopper does with painting. So, I mean, I've asked here, this is stuff I really want you to tackle uh, in, in your books, writing about this, annotating about this, is how much time passes before a photographer moves beyond the references within their own work. When I was putting the slideshow together, I was thinking, you know, there's a decent amount of time has lapsed between Walker Evans making his photographs and Dan Pratt making his. There's been a decent amount of time that's lapsed between Hopper making his paintings of New York and then Dan Pratt making his photographs. Um, but does that change how we deal with the references? So what I mean by that is if there were lots of people photographing in this exact style now and we hadn't had Edward Hopper in the past, would this way of photographing be less exceptional? Um, does the reference 
kind of in posterity become more important. You know, we, we all know what this is like. This happens all the time, especially as we're looking so keenly at the moment at social media and that kind of function within uh, our lives as photographers. You know, you see a lot of photographs that look very, very similar. Do we lose the sense of how important they are or how, how much quality might be in them? Uh, certainly for me, when I look at Dan Pratt's work, because I immediately made those references myself, I, I obviously have studied art my whole life. It was easy for me to pick out why there were similarities between Hopper and his work. The distance in time between the painter working or Walker Evans, the photographer working and what is happening now on Dan Pratt's Instagram page, that kind of adds to its, its beauty maybe because the reference isn't overused now. It's not part of the kind of contemporary paradigm necessarily. Um, and then I was thinking again, it's written here and I want you to think about this as it applies to yourself as photographers. Does the photographer create his own authority? This is a really tricky thing to try and piece apart. I'm, I'm not sure I can do it justice just talking me on my own. But I want you to think, you know, Dan Pratt uh, loves Hopper. Maybe that makes sense then that he would be happy to know that somebody else, not knowing how much he loved Hopper, had been able to see Hopper in his work. However, does that diminish what Dan Pratt does in any way? Now, I've said before, and you know this, when we're in the classroom and we're learning, I'm showing you artists all the time and I'm saying, right, this week let's look at this person and let's make uh, work in this person's style. Now, there's technical elements to that, it's about process, it's also about declarative knowledge, so it's about process is procedural, declarative is I know this, this is what I know. But you all know that actually just copying somebody's work is is not enough to make yourself an artist. And so when I look at these photographs, I am completely seduced by the, the aesthetic quality within them, by the colours, by the harmonies of, of shapes, forms, colours, tones, um, the balance. But would somebody else maybe think, oh, well, he's just a kind of an Instagram version of Walker Evans or just an Instagram version of Edward Hopper. Personally, I really hope not. As I said before, these photographs are beautiful. They are transporting. They're powerfully evocative. Um, and then the last question on the slide, this slide is, is a photographer always chasing the past? because the world is recognisable. Now, what I mean by that is with these references that we build up, especially in a photographer who's, who's, who's well-educated in photography and what other photographers are doing or other visual artists are doing, does it mean that the photographer is always trying to, to make good and their kind of promise to authenticity or to integrity that they go past what somebody else has already done? It's a really interesting thing for us as visual artists because, in my opinion, nothing can exist in a vacuum. We do, of course, take our references from absolutely everywhere around us all the time. And especially when we're learning in a formal environment, if we're in school or college or university, uh, we're looking all the time to our, not just our peers, but obviously things from the past, artists, literature, um, we reference film, photographs, paintings, poetry, whatever. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time chasing that. And that's really useful for us because then it sets what we do in a recognisable format for other people to consume. But then we also have to try and work out how we get past that, how we move away from it. Now, those of you who are taught by me in class will know that I always talk about art maths, which to me is kind of like a horrible title, but it's very important. Art maths is simply the principle that when we look at one artist, if we want to make work that has any kind of individual authority, we can't just copy one artist. 
but that if we want to be inspired, we look at several artists or several forms and we make many references and we synthesize those things together in order to create our own visual identity. In fact, it's not even about attaining or aspiring to create a visual identity. It's about something organic that happens when we synthesize ideas, when we're brave enough to, to think about Hopper and to think about Walker Evans. And then maybe, you know, I also see Saul Leiter in Dan Pratt's work as well, very much so because, I mean, from my point of view, I love Saul Leiter. His work to me is, again, highly aesthetically pleasing. I love the saturation of the colours. I love that zoom in so we're not getting the broad city skylines unless there's this powerful sense of the city of being in the urban environment um you know i wonder much as now i realize dan pratt is aware of hopper like, is he aware also of people like Saul lighter and has he directed the references into his work are they funneled in deliberately or also is it just subliminally subconsciously you know, we like what we like to look at. And that, of course, in itself influences what we then want others to look at that we make. And um, it's written here that Salt Lighter's work can be considered an oblique melange of New York streets, architecture and, inhab and inhabitants. Uh, a window covered with raindrops interests me more than a photograph of a famous person, he said. I love that quote. And I actually think we could apply it um, to Dan Pratt's work as well. You know, Dan Pratt's work is kind of uh, epic in one way. It's very quiet and modest in another. He's not being uh, flashy. In fact, I said in another presentation, and it's something I'll say again here, he's showing us and he's not showing off. You know, it just so happens that he does actually live in one of the most vibrant cities in the world. And he's not hiding that away. But he's also not shoving it in our face in a way that is about his, um, I don't know, there's nothing about his work that says to me that he wants us to feel anything other than beauty in what we see. He's not showing us so we uh, think he's great. It's not like an influencer showing us something that we're then going to covet. I don't covet what I see in Dan Pratt's photographs, but I completely am blown away by the beauty in them. So, you have a task, of course. I want you to consider what references you make in your work. So all of you are making references in your work all of the time. I'm giving you references, you're finding your own references. Again, that could be through visual art, that could be through literature and film. Um, it could be through something you've seen on television, a piece of music, anything. Can you imagine making the photographs of your recent studies without having looked at the work of others? That's really difficult for me to do. I don't know what my work would be had I not seen the work I've seen. And I think this goes back to this notion that our photographs, when we're being authentic, are really who we are. They don't tell us who we are, but they're an extension of, of what we are, who we are, how we are. I, I have a feeling that Dan Pratt, as a person, is probably very like his photographs. And I thought it was interesting, last time when I was interviewing Ben Ashley, there was a lot of what I perceived in the person Ben Ashley when I interviewed him, that I'd found in the enjoyment of looking at his photographs. And isn't it funny, I know this perhaps can't be said of everything or everyone, but I knew I would really like Ben Ashley already when I saw his photographs. And then I did. I enjoyed speaking to him so much. When I look at Dan Pratt's work, I see someone who is exacting, who is precise, who's concerned with beauty. But again, this idea that he's not showing off. Anyway, 
Can art exist in a vacuum? How has what you know influenced what you see and which images you make? And I would like you to write a short essay to explain your answers to these questions, giving key examples of the work you reference in your own. So your recent photographs, whatever they might be, I want you to go back and think about the references you've made and I want you to justify them in context of your own work. Now that essay, I've said a short essay, that is going to be 300 words or more and I would imagine it for most of you, you're going to be writing more than 300 words for this. If you're in A-level class, that of course will contribute to your personal study. If you're in GCSE class, that is going to contribute to your um, opening declaration for your GCSE project. And then stretch and challenge, this is the practical part. I want you to create a series of new photographs that create links between your work and a photographer or a painter of your choice. Consider the use of colour, composition, vantage point and shadow as a means of creating atmosphere, taking the viewer on a visual journey to a specific place and time. So I know that in our current uh, situation, you're not going to be popping up to London anytime soon and taking photographs of grand architecture. Some of you will want to go into Salisbury and make photographs of the architecture there. That's absolutely fine. Others of you might not be in that setting at all. That also is okay. But in the creation of these photographs, I want you to make a very clear link between what you're doing in your own photographs and somebody you study. If I was to go even further and say stretch and stretch and challenge, then you'd probably be looking at more than one source. As I've said before, we're trying to create integrity as visual artists. We don't just want to copy all the time. But my example for this, um, I really like the work of the German photographer Candida Hofer. Um, she works in a way that focuses on um, kind of institutions or places of learning, libraries, um, theatres, cultural institutions often. Uh, and I happened to be, just before lockdown, I was in Newnham College at Cambridge uh, for articulation and I was struck very much by the visual rhythms that were there and it reminded me of Candida Hofer. Now this takes me back to what I was saying about Dan Pratt's work, like when he pushes that button on his camera, is he thinking Edward Hopper? Is he thinking Walker Evans or Saul Leiter? When I made these photographs, I actually was thinking about Candida Hofer. Now, Candida Hofer didn't tell me to make the pictures, but it was so visually obvious to me with these forms of symmetry, for example, that I was very much taking my cues from her work. Um, and the reason why I knew that, and I wasn't making photographs perhaps in my natural or instinctive style, is that often when I think about the relationships of um, shape and space that I like in, in most of my photographs, I do love diagonal shapes, but very often I cut my diagonal across what in this is now symmetrical. So I, I usually have off balance uh, delineation in my work, whereas with these, it's symmetrical. They're interiors, they're pretty much empty, I'm forcing a sense of time and layers of shape and space, repetitions of forms. Um, so I hope you can see there that there are the, the visual references are very, very similar. Um, I'm going to go back to the task. So what you're going to do is you're going to consider what references you make in your work. I want you to think, can you even imagine making photographs uh, in your recent studies without having looked at the work of others? Like, what would that be like? Can art exist in a vacuum? What do you think? I've told you what I think, but what do you think? Um, how has what you know influenced what you see and which images you make? And of course, the task is to write a short essay about that, explaining your answers, justifying it through your own work. Should give me some visual examples in there. Don't just give me a page of writing, please. Put some visual examples in. And then the stretch and challenge is about building these relationships between what you photograph and what you see others having photographed. As always, I'm really looking forward to seeing your photographs. I'm particularly this time looking forward to, to reading what you write and also when I get a chance to hearing what you say 
about some of these notions. The idea that, you know, when we make our photographs, are we engaged with references as we see? Or do we make references after the fact? Who are our references? Why are those our references? What is it about them that makes them so meaningful or beautiful to us? I think these are all valid things to ask ourselves on our learning journey as photographers. So I'll see you next time and thanks for listening.